So I kind of um, want to start off with a big, broad, sort of maybe almost dumb sounding question. But, um, and starting with you, Byron, is there something wrong with the labor market? Is there something fundamentally wrong with the labor market itself, other than the fact that you know, there are lots of people unemployed, or is there something structurally off right now about it? Yeah. I, I think there is something, uh, there, there are a few things wrong with it, and I think you can tell not just by the people who are out of work, but um, that wages are flat, that many people in the workforce are stuck, um, and that uh, employers can't get all the skills that they need. Like if you take that, you say, how could all those three things be? true, um, I think it does point to dysfunctions in the labor market. And I think it's, I think it's a three-part story. The first part is familiar. The, the other two, I think, are much less familiar. The first part is, you know, the technology is changing work, and that's sort of growing jobs at the high-skilled end and some of the low end of the market. But even the ones at the low end of the market require digital skills that not everybody has. Um, and so therefore, you know, people are out of work. That's the kind of classic skills gap story. And there's a lot of truth to it. But it's a very incomplete story. Um, the second thing is that our entire uh, labor market um, has not adjusted to some quite fundamental changes uh, over the last 20 years in the way uh, that employers uh, hire and train and retain. So in terms of hiring, uh, empl U.S. employers would hire massive numbers of people straight out of high school, straight out of college, who not only didn't have these specific technical skills and experiences, they didn't even honestly know how to work. Right? They would be trained uh, from you know, job one. Um, and, uh, and as they trained them, they also retained them. So across the business cycle, um, if you look at the first five or six recessions after World War II, um, for, every, for the drop in demand, uh, employers dealt with that only one third by laying off workers. And two thirds, they kept them on their books. Um, they just took a, a lower, you know, they had lower profit for a while, but they kept them because they had trained them. Um, and then, and they hired back, by the way, as many of the ones they laid off as they could, and that's how the cycle worked. So it all worked together. So you know, roll the tape forward, um, and in the U.S. now, uh, you have employers. Uh, well, in recessions, um, the last two recessions, 100% of the decline in demand was taken out in terms of labor. That changed very quickly in the scheme of things. By the way, that one third, two thirds was always the same in the U.S. and Germany and the U.K. Um, in this last recession, it was 100% taken out in labor in the U.S., uh, one-third still in the U.K., just as always, and none in Germany. They had gone the other way into sort of work sharing and the like. So it's not a necessary uh, state of affairs based on technology or any other kind of objective measure. It's a change in practices. And then in terms of the hiring and training, um, there is a desire now to hire um, like looking for credentials, looking for experience. I want someone with three to five years experience doing this exact job um, and with these degrees. Um, and by the way, I want them at this price. Um, so just to take an extreme example, um, uh, for uh, administrative assistants, 19% of administrative assistants in this country have a four-year bachelor's degree. Um, but 65% of new job postings, new job listings for uh, administrative assistants require require a bachelor's degree in order to be considered, right? So these lead to a third, um, a third dimension of the labor market, which is that um, you have a, a, a marked decline in mobility, in voluntary job mobility. The way most of wage growth has historically happened is people quit a job and get a better job because they're up for it, they're ready. So think about the best administrative assistant probably can't go get another job because they are credentialed out of that better job no matter how much they've been keeping up with their field and how good they are. So you've got people stuck and you can see it in the statistics. This is a much less quoted statistic than some others, but there's a 20, been a 28% decline in voluntary job mobility in this country since the year 2000. We tell ourselves the old story of people are switching jobs very quickly and it's true that they are because they're being laid off, but it's not true that they are because they're finding better jobs or that they're less loyal. In fact, they're stuck. And making transitions um, and on-ramps and off-ramps and anyone following a career path that's not the very narrow and traditional 
is at a really big disadvantage in this job market. And so, yeah, I think the labor market is broken in some pretty fundamental ways. So, yeah, I ask a big question, I'm going to get a big answer. Um, but like, um, So I kind of want to sum up some of that. And then I, I want to ask basically yep. the same question to you. But so, again, you're saying there's sort of almost like you said three parts. But I feel like it's almost four. It's really, again, the, the classic argument that there's a skills gap. There are people do not, there aren't enough coders in the country. There aren't mm -hmm. enough people with kind of those mid-level technical skills for factory work. At the same time, fact, those same factories are laying people off like they never did before during recessions, which probably also are because they're not willing to hold people, you know, kind of cultivate talent through time. Mm -hmm. And then there's this idea that they may want too much to begin with, that they're asking for very specific skills in their job descriptions or whatnot. And then finally, this has all scared people from moving around the country from to job to job, is what it sounds almost like you're saying. Am I interpreting that right? Or? Well, it's not that just that it scared people, and this fits with, I think, what Robert is doing. It's also confused people. So ask yourself how many people in the workforce, there's 150 million adults in the workforce, so while we need to improve high school and college, like let's not forget the people already out there working. Um, how many of them could say, if I work to do X in order to learn Y, I could get to job Z? and like have a good picture of that and therefore be able to unlock. So in other words, the skills gap is not just some natural thing. It's, it's the result of the fact that if you can't give people a path and a clear demand signal to say, if I master this, I can get that job, I can earn more, I can get to a better place, well, then the market's not going to work. As markets get driven off of demand signals, and the demand signal in the labor market is very poor. When you have right such now. an erratic economy, it kills the incentive to learn those skills in a way. Um, yeah. Yeah, Robert, I want to, yeah. because, you know, first off, um, you know, we're talking about how technology can help deal with some of these sorts of problems. And obviously, you know, Glassdoor has done a ton to, uh, you know, make the market a bit more transparent, for one, give people some sense of a career path. And I don't know, I assume most people have used it at some point to look up basically what their, their colleagues are making at work. <laughs> if, uh, if not, you should. It's a great website. People can submit essentially their salaries, their benefits, and um, do reviews of their offices to give you a sense of what it's like to work at these places. Um, and it's an extremely valuable tool. It's only getting bigger. But So I want to ask that same question. Is, from your vantage point, is there something wrong with the labor yeah. market? And what are you guys doing to try to do your part to fix it? Yeah, L let me start with what we're doing. I mean, we are fundamentally addressing a lack of transparency in the labor market. Fundamentally, the hiring transaction that is finding a job and a company deciding to hire someone happens in a tremendous amount of opacity today. Um, there's very poor data on both sides of the equation. I started Glassdoor in 2007 because literally I think where you go to work is probably one of the most important decisions you'll make in your life. We joke the only thing more important is your spouse and kids and if there was a review website for that, most of us probably wouldn't have kids. <laughs> um, but, and it was crazy when we started Glassdoor that, that despite this being so important and figuring out like what is a fair salary for the work you do, um, there was almost no good data to help you do that. As a result of that, poor cultural fits happen, people get deep in the interview process before they realize that the job isn't going to pay what they need it to pay or it doesn't have some key benefit that they need it to have. Um, that's really wasteful for them, it's really wasteful for companies and we believe it's a tremendous drag on the economy. Um, so we're about bringing transparency to that and helping people use our service to find a job in a company they love. At a, at a really macro scale, here's what I think is happening. Here's my, here's my personal hypothesis. Um, the U.S., I think, is in the, at the tail end of a, of a large-scale transition in the economy from a labor economy to a talent economy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it used to be that you needed labor generally to produce stuff. Um, and by the way, that labor was like it or not, largely interchangeable. Um, this is why labor unions came to be, because labor could not per really differentiate itself very much on an on a, on a assembly line. And so you needed the power of collectivism to protect labor. Um, as we've transitioned to a talent economy, a couple things happen. First off, um, you can differentiate yourself. And talent, you can stand out. Um, and that has completely changed the way employers hire and employers think about their employer brand. Mm -hmm. And they're all fighting over this a relatively modest group of people who can stand out in a talent economy um, is the first thing. Um, 
the, the, you know, the fundamental problem is that the labor market today really was designed five decades ago in this, in this labor environment. It was, not in, it was not created in this talent environment. And so we simply don't have the infrastructure, our, our education infrastructure, our hiring infrastructure, to be able to support true development of talent. Um, the second big thing that's happened, and if you look at kind of the academia on this, what I see is there's a consensus that it is routine, they use this phrase, routine jobs that is declining. You, some of you in the room, I'm sure have heard this. Um, and it's true. Like when, we, when our economists at Glassdoor look at this data, what they see is a massive decline in jobs that can be classified as routine. Um, jobs that require the, you know, creativity or collaboration or are non-routine, um, they're the ones that are growing very, very rapidly. That is a skill set that we do not currently teach for, nor do we particularly foster um, in our very competitive workplaces. So, you know, one, you're talking about we don't have this infrastructure set up to, you know, A, create, perhaps create all the talent companies need on that front, but also for employers to find it. You know, what, I'm, I'm wondering, what are employers doing wrong? Are they also missing talent in some way? Are there, are there ways, are they doing things that there they're are people out there with the skills they need that they're kind of maybe passing over them? And why is that happening? Yeah, I, I personally think employers are missing talent, and they're missing it on a rather huge scale. Um, and you know, there's uh, there's uh, there's talent and there's skill. I think there's talent is very widely uh, distributed, but you need to you know through a combination of uh, learning and sort of mentoring and experience. I mean, both academic learning and then absolutely on the job learning and. Uh, these sort of social networks and social capital all translate that into mastery, right, uh, within a given context. And I think um, the opportunity to achieve that mastery is far from evenly distributed. Yeah. So that's one thing. But even so, um, you get people who, uh, you know, you talk about creativity and collaboration as these critical um, sort of skills, and I absolutely agree. And those, in particular, don't land on you just because you went to a four-year degree. You know, you have a four-year degree or whatever. And so we've seen actually, we're working. Opportunity at Work has started working first in information technology jobs, yeah. where it is relatively easy to demonstrate whether you can do something or not. And when you create alternative hiring on ramps, find turns out that there might be in a, in, a, in a city hundreds or even thousands of people who actually can do that job today that would absolutely get screened out, would never get an interview, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanna know if someone can code, you can look at their resume, you can look at their transcript, or you can look at their code. But actually, most employers, 90% plus, will screen you out, right, automatically before they actually see what you can do. So we've seen that, there's a lot of people. But there's something more damaging to the overall economy, which is that if, if there's not a way for people to demonstrate their competence, that they can do this job, then there's no business model for taking people with the aptitude, with the talent, right, but not, not yet the skill, and then actually helping them develop that skill. So in other words, you don't get the pipeline effect. But even today, employers are overlooking uh, I would say, just in the IT sector, certainly tens of thousands of people who could do the jobs that they can't fill. Do you, do you think yeah. that's true? I mean, I, since you're, well, you're in that sector. I, I do to a degree. I, here's what I definitely think is true. Um, we have very, very poor data on the state of the labor market. Um, and that is a real problem. For example, one of my favorites is we know 8.5 million people are unemployed. We have no idea what they actually did. Yeah, because states have not released the data, and it's not in any kind of a database. And like, if we actually knew what their occupations were, like, it would be great to map their skills, and that's the holy grail, and be able to figure out like what training they need to get another skill. Let's start with just what was their occupation? What did they do? Because then you can begin to direct training dollars, and you can start to say, well, there's a whole bunch of people two counties over that had this skill. Or, or had this occupation, this factory shut down, we actually, and we need a bunch of drivers, you know, two counties over or whatever else because a new warehouse opened and there's a bunch of shippers. And we can begin to f connect those dots. We don't currently have the, the information systems that, that BLS uses and everyone else uses were really designed 40 or 50 years ago. Um, the architecture that they use for uh, even what jobs to collect data on are antiquated. They're survey-based, they're not real-time, and this isn't a world where real-time data is the norm. Yeah. And so I think we're reaching crisis point on this because I don't think we can make good decisions without good data. When we have good data and we can figure out where, and we can empower employers then to see 
that they're making these mistakes? Because I think Byron's right about that. I just think that it's not clear at all um, because our visibility is so poor. Well, so how, what, what could government be doing differently? I mean, I imagine there have got to be ways they could pro kind of partner with private sector, maybe, you know, make more of the numbers they do have available, but what more could they be collecting? What, what is it, you know, I guess what concrete steps are there? that you, you see that they could the government could take? I think um, there's most of it falls on this concept of open data. I don't know that a whole lot more data needs to be collected. There's a tremendous amount of data already collected okay. um, via tax, uh, ref, tax uh, reforms, via uh, unemployment filings. Mm -hmm. um, most of it is locked in bureaucracies. And no one wants to know like private information, like literally like what is, you know, this person's tax, whatever. We just want to know like, how many of this occupation are there in this county? And how many in this state? And like, you know, and we, and the bureaucracy is sort of doesn't understand, I think, w how this could be used in an aggregate anonymized way. And so that I think is getting the word out and trying to change that is, could be powerful. Do you think, I mean, is there, let's say that that data was released, I mean, is, would there be a role for private companies to? Yeah, then that's it? the I mean, idea. Yeah. There's tons of companies. I mean, yeah. we would use the data, but we're not alone. There's dozens of companies yeah. like Glassdoor who have really good view into the jobs landscape. Like, we have all jobs available in the United States, and it's up to the hour accurate for the most part. We, we crawl the web, we connect every applicant tracking system, we connect with every major job board, and so, you know, and we're about to launch a map where you can enter a job and see on a map, literally, county by county, where jobs are. That's not the problem. The problem is, where are the unemployed? What are they capable of doing? And how could training, as Byron says, connect them to those jobs? There's a few specific proposals uh, out there. Uh, so the Obama administration has a proposal, um, very inexpensive one, $5 million to modernize um, ONET. That is the, the Department of Labor's sort of taxonomy for jobs and skills, mm -hmm. which most of the job boards and the like are building their databases on top of that. Uh, taxonomy and it's very it's very it's we're not hard. actually it's too poor yeah well you, you're we've, not we've, and we've, throw, we've, that are. we've had to throw out ONET yeah. and rebuild our own real-time one right that that sort of extracts a taxonomy but in real time absolutely and 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 there's a couple of your other uh, other competitors that have done that but for the most part that that's the taxonomy that's being used and actually it, it's it's quite difficult it's one of the reasons that uh, H1B uh, sort of works so poorly because it's it's sort of their, in IT in particular very broad yeah. category so it's very hard to distinguish whether someone's doing a job that many Americans can do or whether it really is a scarce skill because they're just too blunt too right. broad these categories so there's that but there was there in the the workforce uh, uh, Innovation and Opportunity Act that was just passed um, there was there was an effort to get that sort of data sharing but that was uh, rejected on the basis of fears of how the data might be misused, so that is definitely a concern out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would just like to point out, though, that um, while I absolutely agree that the government can do more uh, from an open data standpoint, and that would be very valuable, and nonprofits, for profits, et cetera, could mm -hmm. use that data, we do have to keep in mind that if you look at the money in the public workforce system, which is about, let's say, generously $20 billion a year, um, in the higher education system, it's sort of 10 times that much. Um, the uh, employers spend 25 times as much on training, yeah. um, and they spend about 500 times as much on payroll. So actually, if you want to shape the market behavior, it has very much to do with how employers hire, who they screen out, who they screen in. And I think there are, there are ways, and we're, we, are, we are seeing ways, that without completely upending the, the system, you can create hiring on ramps that allow employers to hire based on competency, based on readiness, rather than based on pedigree and history. Can you just describe an example of that maybe? What, what you know, in the, I, I think I understand what you're saying in the abstract, but just a, a concrete example okay. again of. Right, so an example of a hiring on ramp yeah. is um, a launch code, which operates in St. Louis and Miami and is starting other places. They find. Uh, they find people who actually can code. We, they often bring them in in meetups like Coder Girl Meetup in St. Louis um, and basically give them uh, some coaching, uh, peer network, mm -hmm. assess their skills, and also work with employers to assess 
what skills the employers really need, because they go from the job description, which are usually outlandish uh, descriptions that very few of their existing employees could actually meet, and like really work them down to like, what is it that you really need? And then they make the match. So they did about um, 100 of these, 150 of these in the past year. Um, they're on a, a big growth ramp, and they're placing people with very high success rates into IT apprenticeships and then in full-time jobs. Or you have companies that have tried to do that, and instead, they've hired the people themselves and then competed based on projects, like Catalyst IT Services, which actually um, gets, is, is a very profitable company that hires entirely on this basis. About 40% of their people don't have college degrees. They're not discriminating against people with college degrees, but entirely based on capability, competing at the relatively high end of the market. Mm -hmm. And because they, have, because they get people to play at the top of their game, they only have a 13% turnover a year in a field that has a 50% turnover a year. So their economics are far better than those of their competitors because they've arbitraged this, like, this actually, this sort of poor decision behavior by most employers. Robert, uh, you know, yeah. to me that sounds like it's sort of in keeping with um, Silicon's Val Silicon Valley's sense of itself is, is, you know, a very meritocratic place. Why, in your opinion, aren't there more people kind of, or more companies trying to use those sorts of on-ramps already, or are they in some, in their own way? Is there, you know, is there a reason why we haven't seen more of this evolve? Um, you know, the tech community is very, very meritocratic from the standpoint of most places I've ever worked doesn't, don't really care where you went to school, right? They, they, they want to know basically what you were able to do and whether you were able to write the code or not, to your point. Um, the, like, my experience is we really are in a dearth of technical skills, mm -hmm. right? Our, the education system is fundamentally broken here. 25 states don't recognize computer science as a core uh, skill in teaching. Mm -hmm. um, the UC system classifies it as a, as a you know, a, a elective, the same as, you know, you know, dance or something like this, right? And they won't let that, they won't let kids take it as part of the math track. Um, we are not producing enough people that understand how to work in a world that in which I really do believe, agree with Andreessen, that software is eating the world. We need more people that understand how to do this. That is my industry. It's not a valley thing. We see that in Boston, Austin, you know, New York, every office, you know, sees this, this kind of thing. Um, I think the, the code stuff is, is really cool. It needs to scale. Is, is, I'm excited about it because, you know, everyone's starving, starving for engineering talent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's right. Like we aren't producing enough people. You know, there's probably a million and a half jobs in the next few years that need this. We're going to have probably 400,000 computer science degrees. I agree with that. Teaching coding as a liberal art in schools. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's not to say that you don't need this in our education system because you do. And by the way, to make that happen, you're going to need to teach teachers how to code because we don't. It's much easier to teach a teacher, a good teacher, how to code mm -hmm. than a good coder how to teach. And we're going to hit big bottlenecks in teaching if we don't do that. But it is absolutely true, though, that we are, uh, that's the young people, and we need that. Don't forget the adults, 150 yeah. million of them in the labor market today. And with this catalyst, they're based in Baltimore. Uh, interestingly, in coding, high end of coding, Baltimore, Metro Baltimore is 26% African American. Uh, their coders are 25% African American, hmm. which is unheard that's of. Um, in the Valley or Boston Incredibly or any place yeah. else. And the reason is because they're hiring purely based on talent, actually, and capability, rather than based on all sorts of other implicit biases that we take as signals of quality, but that actually are uh, signals of our familiarity. That's, so, uh, On that note, um, I wish we could keep talking about this all day, but I think we've actually run out of time. Uh, so I want to thank both of you for uh, a wonderful talk. And uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you all. Thank you.